Ah, the introduction. How best to introduce Killer7? Well, I'll say this to start with. It's weird. It's a very weird game. It's also one of my favourite games of all time, and for years it actually was my number one favourite. This was actually kind of odd, because the first time I played Killer7, I did not get it at all. It was 18 years ago, back in 2005, I was 12 years old. I had £40 to spend and went to the game shop and came out with two new PS2 titles, God of War and Killer7. I used to be an avid reader of gaming magazines back then and had of course heard everyone raving about what an instant classic God of War was, but had also heard some really interesting things about Killer7, about how it was super weird but also brilliant in its own way. Well, upon dipping my toe into it, 12 year old me sure did agree that it was super weird, but I was not yet quite on board with the whole brilliant part, because I had never played anything like Killer7, nor have I played or indeed experienced anything like it since. Right away, the game tries to make you feel unsettled with the terrifying sound effects and weird imagery, and that's just the bloody title screen. From then on, it's an onslaught of unusual game mechanics, unique controls, cryptic storytelling, international politics, existential horror, and... Well, let me tell you, as a 12 year old child, I sure wasn't ready for what this game had to offer, and I don't think I even made it past the first level before throwing in the towel. I was just too freaked out by it, and I sure as hell did not understand it. So I sold it and didn't really think about it again for ages, and probably about 4 or 5 years later I saw a pre-owned copy on sale for a few pounds and bought it again thinking it was probably worth another shot. And I'm very glad I did, because all that weirdness, all those subversive game mechanics and the wild ride that is Killer7's plot, well this time I was able to get on its wavelength, if indeed it's even possible to be on the same wavelength as this game. It ended up having a profound effect on me, and it was one that stuck with me long after I finished it, even though I had a lot of trouble following its maniacal breakneck plot. So, taking things back to present day, when I saw this game on sale on Steam the other day, I had to get it. The last time I played it had been on the PS2, many years ago, but having played through it again in preparation for making this video, I can confirm that Killer7 was just as enjoyable, interesting, bizarre and special as it was all those years ago. But enough introductory yammering from me, let's talk about what this game's actually about and why it's so sick. Let's talk about Killer7. Just a quick note before I properly start. I'll first give a somewhat brief introduction to the world and setup of Killer7 before discussing the various gameplay elements of the game before circling back around towards the end to talk about the plot. Good god, it's going to be rough trying to explain anything about this game's plot. There might be minor spoilers here or there throughout the video, but I'll keep any major spoilers for the plot section. Enjoy. Killer7 begins in a way where it clearly doesn't intend for you to realistically be able to follow everything that's happening. Our protagonist, or at least one of them, has a brief rendezvous with their informant, Christopher Mills, collecting some information on our latest assignment, which is to eliminate 14 targets at a location in Seattle, Washington, called the Celtic Building. And they're all fun. We also have to keep one alive to help locate their boss. The thing is, our targets aren't really what you'd call normal. If I'm going to be providing any sort of initial setup of what this game's about, I need to talk about its enemies, the Heaven Smile. The Heaven Smile are both terrifying and enigmatic. Although some of them have vaguely human forms, most other aspects of their appearance are utterly alien. 
They have perpetual crazed smiles fixed to their face, their skins appear in all sorts of colours and patterns, and even their methods of movement range from slow forward shuffling, to flying, to rolling and many more. The three consistent attributes amongst the Heaven Smile are that they always announce their presence with a freaky laugh, <laughs> they always converge on the player's location, and when they eventually reach the player, they'll throw themselves at you, blowing themselves and you up along with them. As far as what the fuck these things actually are, and where they come from, I'll discuss that a bit more later on. But for now, let's just say they're a sort of monstrous, near apocalyptic terrorist organisation. To make things worse, they're also mostly invisible and invulnerable to conventional methods of offence. But the Killer 7 are not regular people, hence why they've been given this latest assignment to hunt down some Heaven Smile. As for the Killer 7 themselves, although not as monstrous as the Heaven Smile, they're just as mysterious. They're an underground group of assassins, available for hire for special assignments that ordinary killers cannot be used for. Thing is, although there are seven of them, as well as a very special eighth member, only one of them are ever really seen at a time. We get a demonstration of this at the start of the first level, when our protagonist, Garcian Smith, just transforms into Dan Smith, as if it were nothing. This is key to what makes the Killer 7 so special their supernatural ability to change personas at the drop of a hat, with different personas specialising in different tasks and targets. And thus the assignment begins, and the Killer 7's first encounter with the Heaven Smile, though it's made clear early on that there are going to be way more than 14 targets here, because they've been duplicating their numbers, an ability which makes them so freakishly dangerous. And I think I'm going to leave it there as far as the setup goes. I'd say that's all you need to know so far. Trust me, I'll get way more into the mental plot later on, but I don't want to go too balls deep just yet. For now, let's talk gameplay. Now, a glance at Killer 7's gameplay might lead a person to assume that this is just a stylish third person shooter. You've got a visible character which you can move around, and you can aim your weapons and transition to a more first person view when in combat. It looks sick as hell. That's what can make it so jarring when you first get control of it and have a go at moving the left analog stick, and nothing happens. Yep, so when I say Killer7 is a super weird game, I'm not just talking about the enemy's characters and plot, I'm very much also talking about the gameplay. See, movement is extremely restrictive in this game. In fact, most of the time you can literally only move in two directions, forward or back. And I don't mean in a linear level design kind of way, I mean you can actually only move your character in a specific predetermined line, either ahead or backwards. It's holding the X or A button on the controller which causes your character to move, and the analog stick only comes into play when you go into aim mode, or for selecting which direction to go in when you reach a predetermined junction. Only then can you pick a new direction based on the often arbitrary selections for where the game will allow you to travel to next. And I really do mean arbitrary too. Sometimes you'll see what seems like a totally viable pathway or road that you'd be able to travel down in any other game, or a clearly optimal route to a specific destination, and it will mean nothing. Each level has its own specific paths to be travelled through, and that's that. Needless to say, this feels very strange to play at first, if not baffling but it's just something you need to accept and power through, and once you get used to it, the weird controls and unconventional and arbitrary placement of traversable routes through each level really do take on a unique charm. When I first played the game as a kid, I couldn't get into this style of gameplay at all, because it wasn't what I was expecting, and it wasn't what I was used to based on any other game I'd ever played. Now, however, I really appreciate this approach, because the actual level design, puzzles and assorted obstacles more than make up for the limitations in movement. See, although the movement itself is very restrictive, this doesn't mean the actual levels are straightforward to navigate. In fact, the layouts can get fairly challenging and complex, not to mention very creative. As the player travels through each level, various obstacles will present themselves, requiring you to switch to the correct smith persona to deal with that obstacle. 
with specific personas being capable of dealing with different types of problems. For example, crumbling walls can be destroyed by Mask the Smith, significant vertical distances can be easily jumped by Coyote Smith, and blood barriers preventing passage can be dissipated by KD Smith's blood shower ability. That's just to mention a few by the way, there are a bunch more types of obstacles which can bar the way forward or prevent access to a key item. Luckily the game makes it really easy to switch personas on the fly which can quickly be done via the pause menu. Almost any member of the Killer7 can switch to any other member at any time. The exception to this is Garcian Smith, who can't transform into anyone else whilst out in the field, at least not by choice of the player. And conversely, no one else can transform into Garcian either. This is because Garcian is a very special member of the Killer7, and that he can revive the others in the event that they're killed whilst out in the field. So if you're playing as, say, Coyote Smith, and you get blown up by a freakish new variant of the Heaven Smile, all is not lost. You can either switch out to a different persona and carry on with the level, or you can switch to Garcian and travel to where the person has died, whereupon they can be revived in a very stylish cutscene and a very strange button tapping minigame. Look, I'm a cleaner. I can feel no remorse when seeing a dead body. To me, it's merely cold, rotting flesh. And so you see, the game's pretty lenient, and that if one of your killers dies whilst fighting the Heaven Smile, it's not a huge deal. However, if Garcian is killed whilst on the way to reviving someone, then yep, game over. Although for the most part, anyone can change over to anyone else, in the later levels, some of the personas will be unavailable for use until a certain number of kills has been achieved, whereupon they can be revived from the TV in the save room. Speaking of save rooms, yeah, they're also done really strangely in this game, because of course. See, dotted all around every level are special areas called Harman's rooms. These rooms seem to be on a different plane of existence, with the size of the interiors often not matching up with the exterior. Furthermore, the rooms seem to exist in some sort of black void and almost always look the same, regardless of where they're entered from. A very interesting catch with killer Seven save rooms is that sometimes they won't actually let you, you know, save. It all depends on the attire of Samantha, the maid. If you enter Harmon's room and she's in formal attire, you get to save. If you go in and she's all casual, no saving for you. Also I played through this game on the more difficult deadly mode for this playthrough, and she certainly seemed to be casual way more than on normal mode. Now I normally don't like restrictions on saving as a means to make a game harder, but I actually found it fine in Killer7, although it can get a bit annoying when you just want to save and she's just sitting over there in her bloody blue jeans. By and large, the game isn't all that stingy with giving you opportunities to save, and you can save as many times as you like at any Harmon's room where Samantha is dressed formally. Also present in every Harmon's room is a TV, and from here you can awaken other personas, convert thick blood into serum, and use that serum to upgrade the stats and abilities of the Killer7. I guess now is a good time to start talking about the combat mechanics. I briefly mentioned the various obstacles thrown at the player through the various levels, but the main obstacle, and indeed the main threat of Killer7, is the Heaven Smile, and these cackling monstrosities are found nearly everywhere. Luckily, it's very easy to tell when there's one in the room with you due to their signature laugh. <laughs> but after you hear that laugh, they will begin walking straight towards your location. As I've said, your character can only really move forward or backwards. However, that doesn't mean you can just disregard anything that isn't directly in front of or behind you, because the Heaven Smile themselves have no issue with occupying space that's unavailable to the player. Although most of the time the threat will be directly in front of you, you have to keep an eye on your sides too, lest you hear that final maniacal laugh as you're enveloped by an explosive, organic, demonic nightmare. Something which makes it that much harder to keep track of the whereabouts of any and all heaven smile in a room is the uncomfortable fact that they're nearly invisible. 
a supernatural attribute which makes him such an existential threat from a narrative point of view. Although mostly transparent, almost as if they're too weird to be fully perceived in this dimension, all Killer7 have a special ability to scan their surroundings and make them appear fully visible, exposing their true forms and colours, and then from here, combat can ensue. Now while the actual feel of combat differs quite a bit depending on which persona is in use, the core combat mechanics are the same. Aiming your weapon is all done from a first person point of view, and whilst in aim mode, your character is fixed in position. From here, after scanning the environment for any nearby heaven smile, you aim and you fire. Almost all parts of the heaven smile can actually be shot off, even their heads, and destroying legs will affect their ability to move at their usual speeds. Enemies in this game can be very tanky, but that all depends on what variant of heaven smile you're firing at, with some going down pretty easily, while others can only be destroyed via quite specific methods. Brute force can overcome almost all variants, but it's far from the best way to go about taking down your enemies, and that is where critical shots come in, probably Killer7's best mechanic. Although the Heaven Smile can have their various body parts blown away, most of the time this will not be the optimal way to get rid of them, even if you go for headshots. The real weak points are the glowing yellow zones appearing at various places around their bodies, such as their elbows, throats or knees. Shooting an enemy just once in these precise spots will get you an extremely satisfying instant critical kill and net you way more thick blood than if you were just to have blasted them away conventionally. It feels immensely rewarding and thrilling hitting these weak points, especially when you've got a whole bunch of heaven smile bearing down on you at once. Although somewhat challenging, things don't usually get too intense on normal difficulty, but on the harder difficulties, the game isn't shy about throwing a ton of enemies at you to keep the pressure up. So when you've got three monsters heading right at you and you manage to nail three critical hits in a row, feels good bro. But it doesn't actually matter if you clear out a room of all enemies, because if you leave and re-enter, they all just come back anyway. This makes it so that you can never get too relaxed, especially with all that spooky laughing going on. You're fucked. You're fucked. In some sections of levels, the enemies will actually infinitely spawn too, meaning you must always be pressing forward. Luckily, there's no ammo in this game, so you never have to worry about that side of things. Now, while your more anthropomorphic variants of Heaven's Smile will tend to follow the rule of having a glowing critical zone on their body, there are many other variants which come in far more anomalous forms. An example of this is the Backside Smile, where you've got to shoot its sickle three times before it'll turn around and reveal its bright yellow critical spot to be hit for an insta-kill. Then there's the Giant Smile, which has to be hit right in its small cyclops eye which is actually super hard, although you can't just bait them into killing themselves, which is pretty sick. One of the most bullshit enemies in the game is the Broken Smile, because while it does have a yellow weak point, it's borderline impossible to actually hit. So for these things, Brute Force really is your only viable option. Anytime you kill a Heaven Smile with a critical hit, you'll get the maximum amount of thick blood, which can be converted into serum by the mad doctor who lives in the TV in the save room. Please don't ask me about that part, because I don't really understand it either. This serum can be used to upgrade the stats of each of the Killer7 personas, but unfortunately there's a maximum amount of serum which can be produced on any one level, before the blood machine will literally just break down and stop working, which is kind of hilarious actually. But it also means you can't farm for serum and just fully power up everyone early on. Although the stats which can be upgraded for each person differ somewhat based on their combat specialties, the main ones are power, which affects damage output, speed, which increases the rate of fire and reload speed, waver, which reduces weapon recoil, I think, and critical, which increases the ease with which enemy weak points can be automatically locked onto after scanning. Upgrading stats also gradually unlocks special combat abilities, such as down attack double tap, and the most OP ability in the game, the counter. Seriously, this ability is absurdly useful. It allows you to easily counter most heaven smile variants just before they attack, giving you a free insta-kill. 
You can pretty much use it as much as you want, and the only downside is that you aren't rewarded with quite as much thick blood for using it. The Combat and Killer 7 both looks and feels equally as weird as nearly everything else in the game. But, like everything else in the game, once you accept the way it is, and get past how strange it initially feels, it becomes super engaging and enjoyable. The Heaven Smile make for consistently cool, terrifying and interesting enemies, and it never gets old seeing all the bizarre new variants the game keeps throwing at you throughout every level, many of which require unique ways of killing them, and some of which can only actually be taken down by specific personas. Which brings us on to the Killer7 themselves, and how they each operate in combat. First, we have our main man, Garcian Smith. He's equipped with a silenced pistol and he is massive. A really cool attention to detail is how when you go into aiming mode, the game takes into account each persona's different heights, with Garcian seeming to be about 7 foot tall. As far as unique combat abilities, Garcian actually has none. This is because he's the one who cleans up any mess made by the personas biting the dust collecting their bloody remains and placing them in his briefcase. Although Garcian has plenty of health, he's also the most vulnerable and that if he dies, it's game over, and so for most of the game it's unwise to use him for combat unless absolutely necessary. Furthermore, he's the only one of the seven whose stats can't be upgraded. Next, there's Dan Smith, also known as the Hellion. Dan is pretty goddamn cool and is straight out of an anime. He's got great damage output but can also turbocharge his shots by consuming test tubes, a resource which accumulates as you kill more and more Heaven Smile. Activating three test tubes before firing will prime up a very flashy collateral shot doing massive damage and being nearly a requirement for taking down certain enemies. See several times in the game you'll encounter these massive regenerators. They are grotesque, tangled growths of flesh hanging from the ceiling and walls and are one of the ways which Heaven Smile are produced. To take them down, you've got to have Dan fire collateral shots at all the large yellow critical spots before the regenerator blows up in a blinding flash of light. His collateral shot is also super handy for taking down grotesque mother smiles by firing into their bulging red bellies responsible for pumping out smaller smiles. <laughs> Third, we have the only female member of the Killer7, KD Smith, armed with a scoped pistol. A fun fact about KD is that her weapon is the same as the Killer7 Magnum from Resident Evil 4. Although her fire speed is not great and her reload speed is even worse, her ability to zoom in on enemy smiles makes her the right choice for a lot of encounters. Attempting to legitimately hit a giant smile in its one eye is a fucking nightmare for everyone except for KD. If you miss too much with her though, she can be especially vulnerable due to her very slow reload speed, so she's best used to pick out far away enemies by carefully hitting their weak spots. Next up we have Kevin Smith. No, not that Kevin Smith. Kevin's the only member of the Killer7 who doesn't use a firearm, instead relying on throwing knives. This, of course, comes with the benefit of never having to reload, with reloading often being the action which will get you killed in this game. As well as being unique in his weapon choice, he's also distinct in that he never utters a single word throughout the entire game. His most special attribute, however, is his ability to turn partially invisible and intangible. Although Kevin wears glasses for most of the game, removing them will activate this special ability allowing him to literally run straight through any heaven smile in the area unnoticed. This can be super handy on harder difficulties when the game starts just throwing tons of enemies at you at a time. In fifth, we have Coyote Smith, who happens to be my favourite out of all the seven personas. He's the one I like to play as the most. Honestly, I just think he's really fucking cool. And he's actually voiced by Benito Martinez, who played David Acevedo in The Shield. If you've never watched The Shield, go watch The Shield. It's sick. Sorry, pal, but this is the moment I've been waiting for. I have to do this or the anger inside will not go away. Coyote's weapon of choice is a revolver, which he holds at a slanted angle when firing. 
Like Dan, he can use a test tube to charge up his next shot, allowing him to fire a custom Magnum shot, although it's not as powerful as Dan's collateral shot. Although getting critical hits on the Heaven Smile is always satisfying in this game, it's made even more satisfying when playing as Coyote, because he'll always follow up a critical attack with this remark. You're fucked. You're fucked. The youngest, fastest, smallest and blindest member of the Killer7 is none other than Con Smith. Con sports a pair of handguns which, although fairly weak, can be fired super fast. As well as his fast rate of fire and high movement speed, he also has the fastest reload speed of anyone. And as if he wasn't fast enough already, his special combat ability is super speed, allowing him to zip around levels and run well clear of any approaching heaven smile. If any enemies do manage to catch up on him however, then it doesn't take much for him to get wrecked due to his very low max health. And last, but certainly not least, it's Mask De Smith. Now this guy is very special indeed. For a start, forgetting guns or knives, how about twin grenade launchers? As far as raw damage output per shot, Mask has to be the top. And it's so buff that he doesn't even have to worry about hitting weak spots to take down his enemies. So of course, this means that you won't be collecting much thick wood when using him due to his inability to hit enemies in precise parts of their body. This isn't the case all the time however, because there are some Heaven Smile variants which can only be killed by Mask, specifically the Protector series. But we're not done talking about Mask yet, because this guy has multiple forms. Although he starts off looking badass as hell, with great damage output, a bit into the game you can totally upgrade him into his second form, increasing his damage, speed and allowing him to charge up his next shot by using test tubes in much the same fashion as Dan or Coyote. Pretty sick, yes? Well, how about his third form, which powers him up even more and makes it so that he never even has to reload? And we're not even going to talk about his final form. Mask is sick as hell and super powerful, and is the best choice for a few of the game's bosses. He's also got the most health out of anyone and can tack tons of hits before dying. As cool as he is though, he's never really been my first choice, mostly because he's not good at all at going for those precise, satisfying critical hits. You know, now that I think of it, maybe he's not so good. No, no, he's awesome. He's sick. Back to the levels themselves, you'll often find yourself having to switch back and forth between the different personas to overcome different types of challenges. As well as this, there are rings. The rings essentially act as key items to be equipped and used to solve puzzles. For example, come across a burning fireplace which has an item you need within it? No problem, just use the water ring. See some motionless wind turbines on the horizon? Why not use the wind ring? It tends to be really obvious which ring you've got to use for specific puzzles, if they can even be called that. But as easy as most of the puzzles are, the game will still go to pains to tell you exactly what to do before nearly any obstacle, and this was one aspect of the game that I didn't care for. An example of this is here, where you see a short gap at the bottom of the wall which you can't get through. Hmm, you'll think to yourself, I bet Khan can get through that due to his short stature. So just before switching out to Khan, maybe you'll talk to this NPC sitting nearby to see what lore he has to deliver, only for him to pretty much tell you the exact solution to the puzzle. Unfortunately, the game does this all the time, which is a shame because there are actually some really cool and creative puzzles, but for some reason the game feels the need to tell you what the solution is most of the time, even when it's really not necessary. The ones who'll be delivering most of the game's exposition and all the game's hints to you throughout each level are what's known in-universe as Remnant Psyches. These are previous victims of the Killer7, whose psyches have remained here even after death, visible only to the personas. There are a bunch that'll crop up throughout the game, with the list only growing as we take out more key targets through each assignment. Even though most of these characters were killed by the Killer7 at some point, None of them will actually show any anger towards the player, 
instead providing insight into the nature of the Killer7 and explaining very important plot information and giving us hints about how to overcome special types of Heaven's smile as well as different puzzles. The five most commonly seen remnant psyches throughout each level are Travis, Iwazaru, Suzy, Kes and Yoon Hyun, each of which serve different roles. Before I talk about these characters, I must point out that although the main characters of this game do all talk like regular folk, the remnant psyches certainly do not. Instead, their speech is indistinct and otherworldly, and not really composed of actual words. Every now and then you'll be able to pick up an actual English word when they're talking, but it's mostly just gibberish. I really like this feature because it just adds to the overall weirdness level of the game. Now as far as helping the player to understand what the hell is even happening in this game, our man Travis is the most important. He'll appear quite frequently in all sorts of weird locations, always wearing tank tops sporting various random words on them each time he appears. He'll give you insight into the nature and history of the Killer7, give you important details regarding key figures relevant to each assignment, and he'll provide you with crucial information on the larger events of the plot, some of which actually go down off screen. Although I'll get more into it later on, a lot happens through this game's story on many levels. In fact, a main theme present here is that of deteriorating relations between the US and Japan, not in real life of course, but in the game. There are a lot of explosive events as well as detailed party politics which can be hard to keep track of, but Travis is there to keep you abreast of all sorts of important developments in the wider in-game world throughout each level. Next is Vincel Del Boris VII Ewazar Sakov, or Ewazaru for short. He's actually the very first NPC you'll interact with in-game and he'll be an ally and confidant for almost the whole way through. Needless to say, Iwazaru is an extremely strange character, always appearing suspended in the air from cords. He's wearing red bondage gear, his eyes are sewn shut, and he's always fixed in the same expression where his index finger is up against his mouth in a sort of hush gesture. Iwazaru is a servant of Harmon, the leader of the Killer7, more on him later, and he'll always end any dialogue with the sentence he doesn't play as important a role as Travis when it comes to explaining the plot, but he is often there to assist with puzzles and giving clues on which Smith persona to switch to to overcome a nearby obstacle. He also appears in every Harmon's room where he acts as a tutorial NPC for all aspects of gameplay. There are significant details about Iwazaru which don't come into play until the very very end of the game. But suffice to say for now, he's a very strange and mysterious character, and we never really fully figured him out. Next up, we have Susie Sumner. I absolutely love this character. She appears in nearly every level, and all that's left of her is her severed head. She's usually to be found lying in very odd places, like a dryer, a drawer, or a fucking treasure chest. And upon finding and interacting with her, she'll always gift you with a new type of ring, telling you. <laughs> Thing is, Susie likes to provide tidbits of her backstory each time you see her. Yeah, Susie's pretty fucked up. Like pretty much every remnant psyche previously killed by the Smiths, she was a killer herself, and each time you find her, she'll tell you details of some horrific part of her life, usually about a brutal murder she committed. Susie has some incredible moments in the game, and whenever I think about Killer7, she is actually one of the first characters that tends to come to mind. Although her speech is as audibly incomprehensible as all the other remnant psyches, she often uses funny and kind of cute emoticons in the subtitles, which I find only adds to the disturbing nature of the stories she tells. Next, we have Kes Ruddy Sunday. 
Kess might be the Killer 7's youngest victim, appearing as a young boy in a blood-stained jumper. He usually appears once or twice per level, but doesn't tend to talk for too long at a time. His role in the game is to warn and inform the player about new, more dangerous variants of the Heaven Smile, usually in the next room. See, for nearly every level, the reason the player is running around solving puzzles is to find special key items called Soul Shells. Soul Shells are found in places where the Killer7 have previously visited and killed people, appearing in most of the game's levels. After the player solves all the puzzles and visits the necessary sections of each level, they travel to a special extra-dimensional zone called the Vinculum Gate. Here you can interact with a strange man behind the counter and hand him your soul shells, allowing passage through the Vinculum Gate and into a mysterious dilapidated coliseum. And this will typically be where you'll encounter Kess, who will recount a horrific interaction he had with a new heaven smile, like the speed smile the laser smile, or the galactic tomahawk smile. Yes, that's an actual name of one of the enemies. <laughs> Kess will also usually appear before the game's several bosses and give tips on how to beat them. Lastly, there's Yoon Hyun, apologies if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, and his mysterious mask. Even though the game has Travis and Iwazaru to guide the player through puzzles, if that's not enough, you've always got Yoon Hyun too, with this NPC pretty much solely existing to give you extra hints on particular puzzles if you need them. If you talk to him, he'll give you a minor hint for a puzzle, but if you shoot his mask, he'll get all rude, but he'll provide a more explicit hint. Honestly, for this playthrough I tended to just not interact with him at all, because I just didn't need help with the puzzles. Well, except for the poster puzzle in the school level, which fucking mystified me, but let's not talk about that. Killer7 has a plethora of bosses too, and guess what, they're also very weird. As you'd expect, the bosses tend to appear at the end of each level and can be quite spectacular. Although I've always played the game on normal difficulty in the past, I went for the harder deadly difficulty this time round, and while it certainly made regular heaven smile encounters more intense by throwing way more of them at you, the bosses were also buffed way up, and so some bosses that gave me zero trouble before suddenly became a massive pain in the arse. Not all the bosses were too tough this time round, to be honest, but there was one fight in particular that nearly made my fucking hair fall out. The player fights Ayame Blackburn twice, with the first encounter being pretty damn challenging, requiring you to hit her whenever she passes under a streetlight in this large car park area. It's a bit of a tough fight because she's really hard to hit due to her speed, but the trick is to use Mask the Smith and fire at the ground near her feet as she passes to get some easy damage off on her. Fairly tough, but nothing too rough. Then we fight her again a little bit later on, where much the same gimmick is used, but she's only vulnerable when stepping out into the light. This was by far the hardest fight in the game, and I think I died more in this one fight than the whole rest of the game. She's just so fucking tanky, and when she reaches critical health, she becomes way faster, does way more damage, and can stun block you. Again, Mask is the best choice here, but even he can struggle like hell despite his substantial health pool. Got her eventually, but not before. The bosses can get really stylish and interesting though, and some actually require a bit of figuring out before you'll be able to beat them, like the fight against Kurahashi and Akaba, where I imagine most people spend the first 10 minutes trying to figure out how the hell you're even supposed to damage them. Or maybe that's just me. Then there's the fight with Curtis Blackburn, which is all about reaction time. Again, this fight was way harder on deadly difficulty, and caused me a couple of deaths. Just as with most of the game's puzzles, it's always very eager to guide you beforehand, so that there's little possibility that you get too stuck, with Kess usually appearing before any major boss to give you a hint on its gimmick. My thoughts on this are pretty much the same as for the puzzles. Most of the time, it'd be better if the game would just trust the player to figure stuff out for themselves. 
It's weird too, because on the main menu, when you're selecting the difficulty, it tells you that deadly difficulty will give you less hints, but there's still bloody hints everywhere. Having just played through the game again though, there was one boss encounter that I found to be particularly disappointing due to missed potential, and that's the fight with the handsome men on Broadway. The level leading up to it is really cool, and the whole concept is sick as fuck. The Killer 7 basically having an epic battle the goddamn Power Rangers. It sets it up like it'll be an awesome boss fight, and then you play it and it's a bit shit. For the fight, each member of the Handsome Men is essentially just a clone of a particular member of the Killer 7. The models are the same, just with a different texture, and you just play out these semi-scripted fights requiring you to shoot at your doppelganger until they or you die. This could have been one of the coolest boss fights in history, and the game builds so much hype for it, but then it ends up being lame, which is a bit sad. So, we've talked about the core gameplay and combat and the level design, but we haven't yet discussed the beautiful, sexy elephant in the room, and that is the graphics and music. Good fucking god. Killer7 is one of the most incredible looking games I have ever played. I have never played anything else as stylish as this. Style is everything in this game, being even more important than the gameplay. In fact, I think that's one of the reasons why the gameplay is so limited. It's so that they could focus on making every single moment look incredible. Both the characters and environments are always bursting with style and colour, with most things being made up of bright textures of solid colour, giving depth through lighting and perspective. All the levels are super varied too, allowing the game to really effectively showcase its distinctive art style. Although you'll start off in a large, multi-purpose building, subsequent levels will have you traversing through wild, wonderful and colourful theme parks, the Dominican Republic and Texas of all places. Hey, even the art style itself changes throughout the game. There are several points throughout the game which feature full-on anime sequences, and the cutscenes on the Cloudman level in particular are in a totally different style from anything else in the game. By the way, recognize this voice? Another one of them reporters. Oh, you still here? What you need? Looking for Almeida, hmm? I couldn't care less about that. One issue I did notice was that the anime style cutscenes are a far poorer video and audio quality it's than anything snap. else in the game. I guess they were able to remaster yeah. everything except these That's sequences in particular for the Steam right. version, which Whoa. is a bit of a shame. This is unbelievable! You really came? I didn't think I had such power. You're one lucky guy, you know that? But back to the sheer style of Killer7, have you ever seen a game which makes reloading look so sick? How the hell does a game make the damn reloading animation into a memorable feature? Like this, that's how. And as truly jaw-droppingly striking and stunning as the visuals are, they are complemented perfectly by the audio design and music. This game is full of weird, distinctive sound effects for nearly everything, and this starts off right from the main menus. Everyone who plays this game remembers the guitar slide, which plays after solving a puzzle. And the healing sound, and the sound effect when using a ring. The most defining sound in all of Killer7, however, is of course this. creepy, unsettling laugh is what it's all about. You hear it all the damn time, and when you do, you know that danger is coming. The pitch of the laugh actually differs too, depending on the size of the Heaven Smile variant, so Micro Smiles laugh like this, <laughs> whereas Protector Smiles laugh like this. <laughs> But as a player, you'll be conditioned to appreciate these sound cues, because it lets you know that there is danger ahead and to be prepared for it. The real horror is when they make this sound. Sometimes one will slip past without you noticing it, and when you hear that sound, it is fucking terrifying. And then of course, there's that goddamn soundtrack. 
one of the best video game soundtracks out there. There are so many freaking bangers here. Great, thumping, fast-paced songs to keep you pumped for the next challenge. Then we have dark, dramatic tracks like the ones that play in rooms with massive regenerators. One of the best and most well-known tracks in the game though is Rave On. This track is nearly impossible not to bounce your head in time with the music. The only bad thing with some of the tracks is how little of them you actually get to hear. I mean Rave On, for example, only plays during a few short staircases linking one area to another. Here. That's all most folks will ever hear of this track when playing the game, which is kind of funny, but it's also a shame because this track slaps. My personal favourite track in the whole game though is Tex-Mex, because it's from my favourite level, Cloudman. This track is so fucking good, I remember just standing around in this level just so I can listen to the music loop again and again, and dude, how sick is the wee guitar solo bit? Damn, I love this song. And so that brings us to Killer7's plot, and oh what a plot. Now I'm not going to try and break down and explain and analyse every event in the game from beginning to end, because I don't think that would be a good way to discuss the world of Killer7, at least as far as this video is concerned. Rather I'm going to talk about the in-game world, some key events, and the nature of the Heaven Smile and the Killer7 themselves. Although Killer7 has a lot of crazy shit going on, including actual monsters and people who can transform from one person to another, there are actually a lot of aspects to its world which are far more grounded, serious and mature, and I believe this is why Killer7 was able to achieve such cult status. See, there's a central political element to the main storyline which plays a huge part in how everything ends up playing out. Although the Killer7 universe shares most of the same elements with our own, everything plays out in an alternative timeline where the US and Japan are fighting a political battle to determine the fate of their countries. In the late 90s, all international disputes were resolved, marking the first time the world had known true peace. To maintain this peace, the main global powers endeavoured to keep the world free of all types of terrorism, so halted all forms of air transportation heavily restricted the flow of information by outlawing the internet. All forms of nuclear energy and research were banned, and every country on earth agreed to detonate any and all weapons of mass destruction outside the earth's orbit, in full view of the world population, symbolising a new era of hope. Shortly after, however, terrorism returned in the form of a new group called the Smiling Faces, or as we know them, the Heaven Smile a uniquely terrifying and bizarre new breed of menace, which traditional law enforcement agencies were powerless to counter. Thus, the unique talents of the Killer7 organisation would be needed to fight back against the existential threat of the Heaven Smile. Indeed, the Killer7's main client throughout most of the game is actually the US, with their informant Christopher Mills being a tool of the government. At the end of the first mission, Angel, we get our first proper introduction to two very important and complex figures within the Killer7 universe, Harmon Smith and Kun Wan. These characters are not straightforward at all to discuss, but they can be somewhat thought of as gods, or at least something close. 
Harmon Smith is the leader of the Killer 7 and has actually acted as the leader of previous Smith syndicates dating back over hundreds of years, though it's important to point out that several different versions of Harmon have existed and will exist in the future. Harmon is a highly confusing element throughout the game because we see him in multiple different versions and forms. Most of the time he's sitting incapacitated and unconscious in his room, while at other times he's allowed to be awoken and engages in important dialogue with other key characters. You also find out later on in the game that he was the first principal of Coburn Elementary School and the first US presidential election was held in 1780. And then we also see a far younger version of Harmon at the top of the Hotel Union where he passes on some highly important and sensitive information about the true identity of Garcia and Smith. Although the nature of Harmon is absurdly convoluted, the main thing to understand is that he and Kun Lan are best friends but also mortal foes, engaged in a war or dance which will never end, with Harmon creating new Smith syndicates and Kun Lan being the creator of the Heaven Smile through the power of the Divine Light emitted from his God Hand. Regarding the God Hand, I'll read a passage about it taken from Hand in Killer 7, a follow-up book released only in Japan containing extra details on the plot and world of Killer 7. I'll provide a link to the English translation by Delta Head Translations in the description, but the passage is as follows. In the beginning, only one type of Heaven Smile existed. But as we altered the characteristics of the light from the hand of God, we were able to create different types of heaven smiles. Additionally, we learned that it was possible to reshape them using machines. In this manner, we varied the possible types of heaven smiles. When a man receives the light from the hand of God, he experiences pure ecstasy. Heaven smiles exist in a constant state of joy and pleasure. That's why they smile. However, simultaneously, their consciousness is under the simple order, one heaven smile must kill one human being. They kill using the bomb organ inside their bodies, made with technology, as their modus operandi. Pretty much all the events of the game tie into the eternal struggle between Harmon and Kun Lan, including the international conflict between the US and Japan, which rears its ugly head after the first mission in the form of 200 missiles of unknown origin headed straight for Japan. Once the US government detects these weapons of mass destruction, an obvious option is highlighted, that being to use defensive missiles to intercept the offensive ones in order to save Japan from certain destruction. Only problem is, does the US consider Japan worth saving or would it be more beneficial to simply allow the nation of Japan to die while the whole world watches? Events transpire in the game involving talks between political figures from the US and Japan, but the talks break down rather violently, and in 2010, all 200 missiles obliterate Japan. Afterwards, we see the head of the fictional Japanese UN party, Kenjiro Matsuoka, being chastised by his elders for not having the balls to do what needed to be done to save Japan, telling him that he should shoot himself in the head for being such a disgrace and then Kun Lan comes into the picture with his god hand. From this point on, Matsuoka is a pawn of Kun Lan, seeking revenge on the US for allowing Japan to be destroyed, and allying with the heaven smile to carry out his mission. As important as Harmon and Kun Lan are to the events of the game, the real main character is actually Garcia Smith, or if we were to call him by his real name, Emir Parkreiner. Emir was a child student who attended Colburn Elementary School, but he was shaped and trained into being a killer, an agent for the Japanese government. At some point, however, Emir snapped and killed everyone at the school, including an FBI agent, Holbert, and an incarnation of Harmon, who was the principal of the school at the time. Emir became an extremely dangerous and prolific professional killer from here, killing hundreds of people across the country, before eventually killing every member of the Smith Syndicate one by one at the Hotel Union. After this, Emir climbs to the roof of the hotel and in a fit of mental distress, shoots himself in the head before being joined by yet another incarnation of Harmon. 
From this point on, a mayor becomes Garcian Smith, who has no recollection of his own previous activity as a mere park rhino, and becomes a member of the Killer Seven, led by Harmon Smith, retaining the ability to transform into any member of the Killer Seven. Things get even more confusing when you consider that some members of the Smith Syndicate have actually been killed multiple times. Take Dan Smith for example, who was previously killed by his mentor, Curtis Blackburn, before he being killed again by Emir at the hotel. The explanation for this is that Harmon has the ability to resurrect people, which is a skill he gives to Garcian, who also has the power to bring any killed Smith persona back to life by collecting their remains. Through the game, Garcian begins to piece together more and more of his lost memory, returning to places like the hotel and Colburn Elementary School where he'd led his previous life. And indeed, we eventually discover what he'd been carrying around in that briefcase of his for the whole game. That being the weapons of all members of the Smith Syndicate who he'd previously murdered 20 years ago. At the end of the game, now that Garcian's latent persona as Emir has been awakened, he visits a decrepit location in Asia called Battleship Island, where the last of the Heaven Smile now roam. Battleship Island is a very mysterious and interesting location in that it's the actual location of that rundown, seemingly extra-dimensional coliseum we've had to run through in every level. Eventually, we track down Matsuoka, who's hidden in a bunker under the coliseum and he gives us the choice to either kill him, in which case whatever broken remnants of Japan which are left are fully obliterated by the US in 2014, or we can let him live, in which case he'll lead a full-scale global invasion of the US as revenge for allowing Japan to be blown up all those years ago. Whatever we choose, he'll first let us know that the very last heaven smile is behind this door, and that we can end the threat for good if we go through. And indeed, we chase a strange figure through a tight corridor, and as we reach the end, we see that it's our faithful servant, Iwizaru, who, as it turns out, looks suspiciously like Kun Lan. What exactly does this mean? I don't know. <laughs> Here's the thing to understand about the plot of Killer7. You can't really understand it. There's so much that happens. The political side of it can be really tough to follow and there's so much stuff that seems to be really important but has little to no explanation. Like at one point, our informant, Christopher Mills, is assassinated and we discover it was this lady who did it. And the game hints that she'll play a more significant role to come, but then she's just never seen or heard from again. Then you've got scenes like this which plays out of nowhere in the alter ego level. Light is caprice. Sometimes it escapes the darkness. Sometimes it hides in it. Sometimes it engulfs us, keeping us warm. Other times it desiccates us with absolute unpity. Wherever the light may lead, a beast awaits. You shall be King Traveler. Who the fuck was that? I think Harmon himself is the most complicated character by far to understand. In fact, I doubt even the writers fully understood Harmon, especially when it comes to all the different avatars and incarnations of him that are said to have appeared throughout time. Another real head scratcher is Dimitri Nightmare. He's the guy that appears next to young Harmon at the top of the Hotel Union. As we learn from Hand in Killer7, he's an extremely significant character when it comes to making any sort of sense of the origin of Harmon's abilities, but you only see him twice in the whole game. He has no dialogue, and it would be impossible to learn even his name just from playing the game. Now, although the way I'm listing all these things might make it seem like I'm really trying to criticise the game, I'm not really. Although I think there are certainly elements which the game could have made more of an attempt to flesh out and explain, it also has the effect of making this world feel far more mysterious and intriguing. While I'm talking about the plot though, I have to talk about my favourite level, Cloudman. This level is kind of an outlier to the rest of your assignments in that it's quite self-contained although there are certainly important underlying connections here 
to the wider events of the game. Cloudman is centred around the eccentric, afro-wielding cult leader Andre Ulmeda. Our introduction to him is, shall we say, explosive, and he invites Garcia and Smith to come challenge him. By the way, I'm not sure I've ever heard voice acting as good as this in any other game. It is perfect, and is key for making the Omeda as interesting and memorable as he is. The people will come to me for salvation. I have a hunch that something's gonna happen. Take this Stacy concert going on right here. Something very bad is gonna happen here. You ever met the kind of people that come to these Stacy concerts? These dudes have got energy to spare. We're talking guys who beat off four times a day. This Throughout Cloudman, we visit a town in Texas where Almeida has set up a hugely successful advertising corporation called First Life. Since it popped up seemingly from nothing, First Life took over the town and Almeida's influence is seen everywhere. See, although it's not really spelled out in game, the whole reason Ulmeda was able to become such a rapid success was because of a very important document referenced all throughout the game called the Yakumo. The Yakumo was a policy document drawn up by a group of Japanese politicians in the early 50s, and the instructions outlined within the document are said to be potent on a nearly supernatural level to the extent that whoever possesses the Yakumo possesses incredible power. Well, Yumeda was a simple postal worker from Arkansas who somehow came across a mere fragment of the Yakumo and, using its guidance, created the First Life Corporation. At the end of the Cloudman level, we encounter Yumeda who explains that in his past he infected himself with nearly every pathogen known to man, each time overcoming them and you know, why don't I just let the man himself explain in that wonderful voice of his. Paradise. Life here is perfectly autonomous, a model of peace. But our corporation, First Life Inc., <laughs> it doesn't exist, no sir. It just runs commercials. You see, people judge books by the covers. Oh, today's job is done. Ah oh, yes, you just might be able to meet today's lucky guy. Don't be alarmed, these are good citizens, no heaven smile. Our man, Clemens, congratulations! Me? Is it really me? Wow, I, I can't believe it! <laughs> Relax, Clemens, your job has just begun. Calm down, or you'll frighten Lady Luck away. You're, you're right, um, what should I do? <laughs> like I told you, first, you need to relax. Your job will be here any moment. Clements, this is yours. Go ahead, take a spin. Huh? This car? Is it really mine? Of course it is. Now take it and do what you want with it. It's really, really mine. Hop in and find out. This job had a five million dollar price tag. This is what he gets to do. This is what I call driving yourself to death. How long will Clements last, or will he cross the finish line? If he makes it, he wins. So, uh, I infected myself with all kinds of deadly viruses. I overcame them time after time, discovering vaccines and creating medicine on the way. I overcame all the symptoms. <sighs> but them smileys, whew, they're different. The risks involved are at another realm. I mean, it's flirting with fucking death itself. Uh, uh, I want you.
to kill me. As if to confirm his fears, Romeda does indeed transform into a heaven smile shortly after being apprehended by the US military, and it's on the Killer 7 to end him. What happened to Mr. Olmeda? Huh? Uh, uh, this... This blood... It tastes like Mr. Olmeda's. So... He's dead, isn't he? I've always had a sixth sense. Uh, if I had only attained Mr. Olmeda's level earlier... Clements, you're in control of things now. Walk down the path of life. Don't succumb to weakness. Take the big risks. Rest assured, Master Olmeda. I will watch over this town. Our way of life stands eternal. May peace rest with our great Olmeda. Our Messiah. The name's Andre Olmeda. I'm probably not doing it justice here, but this level is next level. The setting, atmosphere and especially the music are perfect. And for me, you'll made it is one of the greatest video game characters out there, even though he's only present in the game for one level. Again, the Cloudman level isn't at all essential for understanding the wider plot, but I couldn't make a retrospective about Killer7 without talking about it at some point. Killer7 is a very special game, and having replayed it again for this video, I think it's back up there as one of my all time favourites again. Because of the highly unconventional gameplay mechanics, unsettling nature and sometimes incomprehensible plot, it can be a real challenge to get into at first, but a little bit of perseverance with it reveals a fascinating and stylish diamond of a game, the true likes of which I don't think we'll ever see again. The game's unique and bold blend of demonic horror weirdness and complex international politics results in a story that's likely to stick with you for long after you've played it through to the end. And that's that. I hope you enjoyed my thoughts on this incredible game, and as always, thanks for watching.